Hello everyone. So we've spent some time talking about the monad type class and looking at some examples. Um, in this video I want to go a little more in depth into what monads are and some different ways to think about them. Um, so monads kind of have this reputation of being confusing and scary. Um, <clears throat> there's I think a bunch of people that they hear about Haskell and like all they've heard about is you know that Haskell has these scary things called monads. Um, and that reputation is in some sense deserved and in some sense undeserved. So uh, the sense in which it's undeserved is that as we've seen, um, you know, here's the definition of monad. The definition is actually very simple. It's like kind of two lines. Well, given the definition of applicative, right? So a monad is any applicative that also has this, you know, a function of this type. Um, but it's deserved in the sense that uh, monads turn out to be an extremely deep topic. And by deep, I mean uh, the, amount of, um, the amount of consequences and connections to other things relative to the size of the definition is very large. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like the concept of a group if you've taken uh, abstract algebra, where the definition of a group is pretty simple. You can explain the definition in a few minutes, but it has huge implications um, and lots to un unpack. Um, or the definition of a Turing machine, right? A Turing machine is a very simple concept, but it turns out to be, um, you know, very deep. There's a lot of stuff to, to think about there and a lot of uh, relationships to other things. So um, I want to talk today about three different ways to think about the definition of a monad. And the interesting thing is that they're, they don't at first appear to have anything to do with each other, but they turn out to be all equivalent. Um, and this is often in, in math and in computer science, um, you know, a big indicator that you, you've stumbled on a very deep concept if there's sort of multiple seemingly different yet ultimately equivalent ways to define it. Um, that you, you really, there's the, the underlying concept is actually very fundamental um, and kind of independent of the way you define it. So we've already seen this first uh, definition, right? It just literally says um, a monad is an applicative with this extra bind method, right? And we motivated this by saying um, you know, applicative gives you a way the app operator lets you compose two computations, um, like combine two computations into one and uh, combine their outputs, All right? And Monad just says, well, let's add a bit, little bit of dependency to that so that uh, you don't necessarily have to know up front what two computations you want to run. The second computation can depend on the output of the first. So we can run the first one and then decide which one we want to do second based on the output of the first. Okay, so this is a natural thing we want to do. Um, so I have a bunch of challenges throughout this file, and I'm going to post this file on the website, of course, and you can uh, download it and play along. So uh, the challenges here are to show that uh, every monad has to be both a functor and an applicative. So, and remember, actually, I should point out that you know, there's also this thing called return, which is basically the same as pure. So, but we can say, you know, if you have a monad that has this bind and return, um, can you make, can you also implement the applicative methods and the functor methods? Okay. So the first challenge is to say, if you have uh, a function of the type of bind, if you have a bind and you have a return. So this, these types look a little scary, but the for alls here are necessary because we, we want to say like, this first thing really is a polymorphic function that you can use with any types A and B. And that's going to be important because we might not we might need to use them to implement this at various different types. So if we have a bind function that'll work for any A and B, um, and we also have this A to MA function return that works for any type A, then can we implement fmap? And so, right, see if you can basically fill something in that makes this type check um, that says, you know, uh, and I've already I've already put here, so this is bind is this argument here, and then ret is this argument here, right? And then can you, you know, it'll say like lambda, you know, lambda f, lambda ma, and then can you make something of type mb using these things? Okay, so that's the challenge. And then this other challenge is that we can actually implement, so of course pure is the same as return, so that's not interesting to think about, but this app operation, um, that we can actually implement that in terms of bind if we also have fmap. And so we already showed that we can implement fmap. Um, 
but in this one you can just use fmap directly because we have a functor constraint here. So if you have this, again, this bind thing, can you implement something of the type of app? So I challenge you to see if you can do those. I'm not going to do them in this video, um, but it's a fun exercise to show that in fact monad is sort of is indeed more powerful than uh, applicative and functor, or it's a you could think of it as a subset of those things. Right? Okay, so here's the second way to define uh, what a monad is, and the motivation uh, one way to motivate this is to think about this fmap2 function that we wrote a while ago, right? So uh, you know, let's again say we just have a functor, and we want to say if I have a function from a to b to c. Where we're at a function of fa to fb to fc, and we already know that functor is not enough to do this, right? This is this is how we originally motivated applicative, um, but let's try again. And let's try in a slightly different way, and we'll see how um, we could end up with a motivation for something else. So we'll call this g. I got my fa and my fb. So of course, the first thing I can do is I can take this function a to b to c, and I can f map it uh, over this fa. So if I say g f map f a, so now this has type. So actually, here let's put this down here. So that is going to have the type f of b to c. Okay. Um, and. Uh, So the next thing that we could do is that we can, uh, if we use fmap again, so I'm going to do fmap something over this. So this thing is an f b to c, and so. Here we're going to put a function that will take a b to c and produce something else. So we'll call it h to something. And the thing I'm going to do with that h is I'm going to fmap it over the fb. Uh, it's a little convoluted to think about this, but um, right again, this is an fb to c, so then I'm going to map something over that. So I need a function that goes from b to c to something else. And so I'm going to take the b to c function and map it over the fb, which is going to give me an fc. So all in all, this should give us an f f c. And if you if that went too fast, I strongly encourage you to pause the video and like kind of work this out for yourself in more detail. Um, Let's just confirm. So it should I should get an error that tells me right. Well, okay. Yeah. See, there we go. It says expected type FC, but actual type FFC. That's exactly right. So I said this is an FFC, but of course that's not right because we want an FC, and so this is motivating this. Um, if we had a way to sort of collapse a nested F into a single F, then we could make this work. Okay, and so that is in fact there is a function called join that has the type m m m a to m a. Okay, so for any monad, it turns out that we can do this. We can collapse sort of two nested m's into a single m. In other words, if you have kind of two layers of effects, whatever kind of effects that m describes, you have two layers of those effects, you can collapse them into one layer. Um, so this turns out to be, and not only can we implement this for any monad, but actually this is an equivalent way to define monad. So you could say a monad is any applicative that also has this join method, right? So we could say so alternative definition of monad could say something like class monadish m. So if it's applicative. Then we would say, you know, join M -M -A. M -A. Not at all obvious, but this turns out to be entirely equivalent to the original definition. Um, the 
comment that out because it doesn't actually type check. Um, so, again, uh, well, let's do a couple examples. So, for example, um, actually, let's make let's actually make this. We'll call this joiny. So, you know, we for example, we can say instance monad ish uh, maybe where right joiny we have to have a maybe maybe a to a maybe a. So I need to turn on this extension, I think. No. Okay. Um, well, how do we do that? We just pattern match, right? So if I have a nothing, I get nothing. If I get a just nothing, I'm gonna also output nothing. Oops. And joiny of just just a is just a. Okay. Uh, and I do need this. Okay, so that's one example of implementing this kind of join method that collapses two levels of possible failure into one. Right? You could also give an instance for you know lists where right and now we have to give a list list a to a list a. And actually we saw this come up the other day. Uh, this is just the concat function. Uh, and you could try doing other examples yourself. Um, and in, in, in fact, in many cases, it's actually easier to think about this join function and what it does than to implement the bind function directly. So here's the challenge for you, or some challenges. First, basically we're going to show that you could, we can define monad in terms of bind, or we could define it in terms of join. And no matter which one we define, we could define the other one using it. Okay, so this one says, if you're given a function that has the type of join, then you can implement something that has the type of bind. And you also, whoops, I forgot to get rid of those solutions. Okay. Uh, you know, don't look at those, I guess. Go back and look at them if you're really stuck. The version I'm going to post on the website won't, won't have those there. Um, so this one, it, you get to use fmap if you want. Um, and you can use this join function, and then you've got to implement something of the type of bind. And then vice versa. If you have bind, you can implement join. And so this joining idea uh, turns out to be sort of equivalent to it's exactly what we need to be able to do to be able to do this uh, dependent composition. Okay. Um, so one more way to define this, to define monads. Um, let's say I have a function g that takes a string and uh, if the string consists of all digits then it's going to read it and turn it into an int. Okay, but if it's not all digits, then it's going to fail and say nothing. Okay, because read, in fact, would crash if you give it something that um, doesn't look like what we want. So this is kind of a safe version of read that will give us a nothing if it doesn't uh, if it isn't successful. This only you know handles positive numbers, but you know you can make it more sophisticated if you want. Here's a function f that takes an int uh, and gives us a maybe double. So um, I don't, this is kind of arbitrary, but basically it's doing this function, the square root of n minus 10. Um, but of course, that's only safe if n is at least 10. If n is at least 10, then this will be positive, and then we can take the square root. But if n is less than 10, this will be a negative number, and the square root is not going to exist as a double. I mean, we could make it a complex number or something. But um, okay, and then it's it's giving us a maybe again. So the question is, I want to do both of these in sequence, right? I want to say I have a string. And I want to turn it into a number and apply this function to it. But right, there's two points of possible failure. It could fail to parse, or it could fail to be a big enough number. And so, you know, can I kind of compose these two things into a string to maybe double? So I want something like that says uh, string to maybe int int to maybe double. a string to maybe double, right? And I can kind of generalize this and say, well, the fact that it's strings and ints doesn't really matter. Like, this could be any A and any B, and this will go from B to C, and then I want to go from A to C, right? And this is really very similar to function composition, except I've got these maybes everywhere. So it's like, that's why I call it effectful function composition. Uh, it's function composition when things could possibly fail, in the specific case of maybe, right? And, but, uh, 
the question is, can we generalize this even more and say, like, what kinds of functors can we do this for? And it turns out the answer is exactly monads. So, uh, you know, we can generalize this yet more and say, implement something of this type. So let's actually try to implement this. Um, again, you might want to pause the video here and see if you can implement this yourself. Um, <clears throat> but let's see, if we've got our function, we'll call this g and we'll call this h. So g is this a to mb function, h is our b to mc, and then I'm going to take an a and I've got to return an mc. Well, I can apply g to a, right? g takes an a, so that'll give me an mb. And then I've got this b to mc function. Well, this is just bind, right? I want to say take the result of this mb and feed that into this function to give me the mc. And so I do bind h, and that's it. That's the whole implementation. Okay. Uh, so this is called. Uh, there's actually an operator for this in the standard library, and I call this operator the fish operator. Uh, it looks like a little fish. There's also one swimming the other way that just composes things in the backwards order. Uh, which actually the backwards order is actually how function co the function composition operator works, like the dot. Um, but this one you can think about kind of things flowing from left to right. So the challenge related to this is, you know, so we just saw how to implement the fish operator given bind, but again it turns out that we can do it the other way around. Uh, so it's possible given if you had an implementation of this fish operator, this effectful composition operator, then you could implement bind. And so, whoops, again, I just forgot to take out these solutions. Okay, anyway, uh, so you can try that yourself uh, and see how that works. So this would be a third way we could define monad. We could say a monad is uh, an applicative that also supports this uh, this fish operation. Um, okay, so have fun trying out those challenges. Um, and playing around with some instances and exploring a little bit more about uh, what monads are. <clears throat>